House Republicans in disarray. We will go wherever the evidence takes us. Speaker Kevin McCarthy opens an impeachment inquiry into the president, all to appease his most extreme members, just weeks before a deadline to fund the government. Mr. Speaker, you are out of compliance. The path forward for the House of Representatives is to either bring you into immediate total compliance or remove you. I showed frustration in here because I am frustrated. Facing threats of losing his speakership, McCarthy confronts his detractors in a fiery meeting. Plus... Will the president pardon or commute his son uh, if he's convicted? So I've answered this question before, and I was very clear, and I said no. Hunter Biden is indicted on federal gun charges. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation. Committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm Laura Barone Lopez. Jeffrey Goldberg is away. House Republicans are in turmoil again. Under pressure from the far right, Speaker Kevin McCarthy launched a formal impeachment inquiry based on no evidence into President Joe Biden. The move, taken within hours of returning from summer recess, didn't work. Right-wing members say if they don't have all their demands met, they'll shut down the government. And they're threatening McCarthy's gavel to prove they mean it. We talked about balanced budgets, term limits, single subject spending bills. Those things have not happened. And so he's, he's throwing impeachment out like an ill cast lure and he has no real intent to follow through. By week's end, in an expletive laden speech behind closed doors, McCarthy dared his detractors to remove him. I don't walk away from a battle. I knew changing Washington would not be easy. And you know what, if it takes a fight, I'll have a fight. Meanwhile, Democrats are rallying behind the president, separating him from his son, who was indicted Thursday on three federal gun charges. The Hunter Biden matter is pending before a court. With respect to President Biden, there is no evidence, not a shred of evidence, that President Biden engaged in wrongdoing. Joining me to discuss this and more, Leanne Caldwell, co-author of the Washington Post's early 202 newsletter and a Washington Post live anchor. Andrew Desiderio, senior congressional reporter for Punchbowl News. Weijia Zhang, the senior White House correspondent for CBS News. And Heidi Prisbola, a, new, a national investigative correspondent at Politico. Thank you all for joining tonight. Heidi, I want to start with you. Hunter may very well face additional charges beyond these three gun charges that deal with him uh, making false statements about firearms that he purchased. But his lawyer questioned whether or not these charges were constitutional. Why? Well, there's the constitutionality, because in 2022, the Supreme Court actually made it more difficult to bring charges like these. And you start from a base of these charges as standalone charges being very unusual to be brought alone, according to legal experts. And that's why he's asking the question, the attorney, the defense attorney, of why this is happening now when the prosecutor's known about this for years. Uh, and the law has actually gotten more difficult to prosecute for this. He says the only thing that's changed, in his opinion, is the politics. Weijia, uh, this complicates the president's re-election a bit. I mean, how is the White House responding to this? Well, it complicates it in that they have to spend time answering the questions that they will no doubt continue fielding about this. But the White House's strategy um, has been pretty clear in this case to try to 
create as much separation as possible between any of these independent investigations by the Department of Justice and President Biden himself. And we have seen a shift in tone from the president, who at one point several months ago was saying things like, my son did nothing wrong. And now he is not saying that. He has switched to saying um, how much he supports his son um, and, uh, and how much he loves his son, because, of course, he doesn't want to give any ammo to anyone who is trying to accuse um, uh, the, the White House of having anything to do with uh, DOJ investigations, especially one that has to do with Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. And so they are trying to uh, move forward, trying to focus on other things. But of course, this is the president's son, and no um, U.S. government has ever, you know, put felony charges against the child of a sitting president. Mm -hmm. So it is historic. But it's something that I think, you know, the White House would like to not talk about. Right. I mean, Hunter Biden, Leanne, is at the center of this impeachment inquiry that House Republicans just launched. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there any evidence that President Biden took a bribe or that President Biden uh, used his influence to benefit his son Hunter at all? There isn't. There's no evidence yet. And that is... There's some Republicans who wanted to peach, impeach President Biden because of this yesterday. But most Republicans say, including Kevin McCarthy, we need to continue to investigate. We have found uh, some smoking guns, and while there's no direct connection yet, that is the reason we need to open an impeachment inquiry and need to keep investigating. But there is absolutely no evidence yet. There are some people who have come forward that the Republicans thought would uh, maybe be able to draw that connection. It's uh, one of Devin Archer, who is one of Hunter Biden's former uh, business partners. And the transcripts of that uh, deposition showed that Devin Archer said, no, President Biden was never involved. Yes, he would stop by and say hi sometimes, but there was no illicit activity. Um, but Republicans are continuing to go down this path, even though impeachment inquiry is also very political at this moment. I just say, they've, they've also had these suspicious transaction reports from the Treasury for many, many months, and nothing has come out of there. And the only documentation that they've pointed to is a family cell phone plan and some text messages that Hunter sent while he was addicted to crack cocaine. I mean, Andrew, to, to Leanne's point about the fact that there are a number of House Republicans who did not want to go down this path, what are Senate Republicans saying? Well, there is that group of House Republicans to start that come from districts that President Biden won in 2020. They are the ones who do not want to vote on the House floor to open up an inquiry. What Speaker McCarthy essentially did was, was declare uh, by edict that, yes, we're opening, opening up an inquiry, even though a, f a few years prior he had criticized that tactic that Speaker Pelosi had used. So that's number one. Number two is the fact that you see Senate Republicans really skeptical of this right now. Um, I talked with Senator John Thune, the number two Senate Republican, a few days ago, and he said that uh, he believes that, uh, or he fears that impeachment has become weaponized, that it's, be it's become too political over the last few years or so. Um, and he worries that it would put another thing on Congress's plate uh, at a time when they have so much to do on the must-pass agenda, right? Government funding, the annual defense bill, uh, the reauthorizing the FAA, the farm bill. These are major things that Congress has to get done. And they're right now in a huge time crunch. Imagine throwing an impeachment trial on the Senate uh, at this time. And what Senator Thune basically said was that it would not be advantageous for an impeachment trial to move forward right now. So we've established that there's no evidence right now linking uh, Hunter Biden's business dealings to Joe Biden, and that there are a number of Senate Republicans and House Republicans that don't want to do it. So I want us to focus on the why, uh, why they're doing this. And we might find some insight if we look back to 2015 and the GOP Benghazi investigation. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Heidi, is this Benghazi 2.0? I mean, is the goal for McCarthy, as he admitted then, but this time around, to politically damage a uh, Republican's opponent? Well, they haven't come across any new evidence that they're citing that 
warrants this impeachment inquiry. And we in Politico reported that a senior Republican actually said that they thought it would be best timed around the convention to maximize political damage. Now, that's not quite as blatant as what uh, McCarthy said there in 2015, but it, you can't deny that there is an absolute political calculation that was made here that this might appease those right-wing uh, legislators who were pressuring him, but that lasted no more than, what, like 24 hours before Matt Gates kind of shut that down. Um, but look, he, he's right. Just creating the illusion of impropriety can politically be very advantageous. And we saw that not only with Benghazi, we saw it with WikiLeaks, all of us who covered Hillary Clinton. I would interview people, and they couldn't tell me what was so damning about WikiLeaks, but just the word itself had a connotation that had been created from a branding campaign by, by Republicans. And of course, we don't talk about WikiLeaks anymore. Mm -hmm. A lot of potentially just smoke and mirrors and, and a revenge, uh, which we know that Former President Trump has also been talking to them, saying that he wants them to go down this path. But we the White House has been preparing for this. They've been waiting for this. Uh, House Republicans haven't set a deadline, so this inquiry could go on for as long as, as they want it to. Uh, how is the White House preparing for that? Well, as you mentioned, they already have a very robust war room that they had before it became an official inquiry. And I think that the strategy has largely remained the same, which is trying to discredit the investigators, discredit the investigation, and focus on what the president is doing. As we've been talking about tonight, you know, when you hear anyone from the White House talk about this, their main point is that there is no evidence. And so they use that to frame this as a political witch hunt. Um, and, you know, they also point to the fact that they can't even get the votes to have a vote about this um, because there are Republicans in McCarthy's own party who disagree with moving ahead with this. So, you know, they're trying to put more attention on what the president is doing. But the question is whether that's enough to overcome, um, you know, how this could be impacting the public opinion of Joe Biden, who largely until now, I mean, was pretty pristine. I mean, when it comes to something that might question, um, you know, whether he had committed high crimes and misdemeanors. So I think just that question alone being out there obviously impacts the White House in a way. But they are prepared. They are ramping up their attacks. They are even asking formally um, news organizations to, you know, hear their talking points. They listed them out, sent them out to mm -hmm. network presidents, as an example. So they're really trying uh, to get their points across. Right. In that uh, memo that they sent out, they also detailed some of the facts that you highlighted, Leanne, which was that some of Hunter Biden's own former associates said, there's nothing here, the, the, the president never discussed uh, business with his son. But this impeachment inquiry was meant to win over these far-right Republicans. McCarthy announced it to win them over to try to then get them to agree to fund the government. And it didn't work. I mean, there was expletives hurled, curse yeah. words at a <laughs> behind-this-closed-door meeting. I mean, is the threat to oust McCarthy, which some of these hardliners are making, is it real? So... It is real. There are some in the party who do absolutely want to do it. Um, McCarthy should have been listening to his members before it, because I was reporting, and others too, that leading up to this new session, um, these hardline Republicans were saying, yes, we want impeachment, but McCarthy giving us impeachment is not going to solve the financial, the debt crisis either. And so we all knew that these were not going to be connected, and these far-right Republicans are continuing to keep impeachment and the budget issues separate. But as far as McCarthy's threat to his speakership, whether it's, re whether it's a possibility that he could actually lose his job, because let's remember, he needs, there needs to be 218 votes uh, to remove him from his position. Um, and he still has the support of a large swath of the party. But McCarthy is governing under the fear of losing his gavel. And so he is placating repeatedly over the last several months, and especially now, um, the far right, to, to address that fear. But these most of these people, they, they want what they want. They usually don't fund uh, the gov vote to fund the government. They usually don't fund or vote to fund short-term spending bills. 
So he's trying to negotiate with people who are never going to come to the table. Right. Negotiating with hostage takers, even though yeah. they may not be willing to ultimately vote for this in Absolutely. the end. I mean, Heidi, McCarthy appears to be prioritizing, based on what Leanne is saying, his speakership over the House majority. Yeah, I, look, uh, this time feels a little different to me, only because we do have this new rule that it only takes one person to bring up the motion to vacate. And uh, Leanne and I have <laughs> covered many a uh, potential shutdown together. And, and this feels different uh, to me because of that, because it only takes one person. And I think what may ultimately decide this is actually how the Democrats want to treat it, too. Are the Democrats having any discussion whatsoever about saving McCarthy? Because if Democrats all stick together, um, it would only take, I think, like five Republicans to, so, to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, you could speak well, more I, about I, this, but I, yeah. that's, uh, that's, I think, a fascinating question. If he can't satisfy them because he's not going to be able to, because the Senate will not go along with it ultimately to give them what they want. Um, a deal was already cut on the, on the debt ceiling and the budget. And uh, he, he, now he's going to also disappoint them on an impeachment vote because it's unclear whether they have the votes for that either. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to say that I actually asked Hakeem Jeffries that exact question yesterday, if, the, if Democrats are going to save McCarthy or going to help oust him if the opportunity arises. He said they have not had a caucus-wide discussion about it yet. But Democrats that I'm talking, talking to privately say, if there's a lot of goodwill for, with McCarthy, um, they would probably help him keep his job. But opening an impeachment inquiry against President Biden under no evidence does not help that mm -hmm. goodwill. And also, uh, when he is trying to jam through Republican-only spending bills, leading them to a government shutdown, that also does not provide any goodwill. So McCarthy is kind of negotiating with the devil here, and the people who could help keep people the government open and who could save him don't really have any uh, inclination at this point to yet. On that government funding deadline, Andrew, it's September 30th, and you think that w something that could potentially cause House Republicans to go over that edge is Ukraine funding. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Kevin McCarthy is looking to use Ukraine funding as essentially a, a bargaining chip with the administration to try to get some border policy changes and additional border funding. The White House has asked for $4 billion as part of the supplemental uh, funding request for specifically the border. House Republicans don't think that that's enough. And obviously McCarthy has the problem within his, within his conference of there's about a third of them who do not support Ukraine funding anymore. Um, so he has to think about that. And, you know, when the House eventually sends a stopgap funding bill to the Senate, the Senate is going to add Ukraine aid to it, right? Uh, there is broad bipartisan support in the Senate for that. Schumer and McConnell are essentially locking arms on this issue. You send it back to the House, what's McCarthy going to do? Is he going to put that on the floor or not? Uh, and many of these members who have threatened to use this motion to vacate have said that Ukraine is a red line for them, that they do not want to continue funding the Ukrainian military. Obviously, next week or this coming week, mm -hmm. uh, President Zelensky is going to be in, in Washington. He's going to be in New York first for the Which UN you General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he's going to come to Capitol Hill after he comes to the White House. Um, and those meetings are going to be critical. And it couldn't come at a better time, frankly, for the White House and for people like uh, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, who have really been banging this drum for a very long time. Uh, and we'll see if he changes any minds. And it could get potentially awkward with the speaker, knowing what we and others have reported, which is that the speaker wants to use funding for Ukraine uh, as leverage for something else. But Mitch McConnell, he's not going to budge on this, right? Because he could be having this face off with, with McCarthy specifically on whether or not to continue aiding Ukraine as they fight Russian aggression. McConnell is extremely passionate about this issue. He believes that the Republican Party is trending in the wrong direction uh, on foreign policy in general. He believes that's largely the fault of Donald Trump and those aligned with him. Um, so he's looking at what's happening in the House right now with real panic. And what he's done over the last couple weeks is every single day he's gone to the Senate floor and he's, he's trying to rebut point by point the arguments of those who want to cut off funding for Ukraine. And he's pretty directly saying, yes, it's members of my own party. Um, he isn't naming McCarthy directly or specific members, but what he's trying to do is continue to make the case and make the case to our allies and to the Russians, frankly, uh, that there, there remains solid, strong bipartisan support for funding Ukraine. And if you were to put that on the floor at both the House and the Senate, it would obviously 
obviously pass overwhelmingly. The question is, uh, for McCarthy, does it impact his political future if he does that? Mm -hmm. and, and as the House is in chaos, Weijia, um, Biden's week has included the launch of this impeachment inquiry, uh, his son being indicted, today uh, the United Auto Workers strike. Uh, what is, I mean, how is the White House, how is the president himself responding to this week that he's had? Well, and not to mention a pretty alarming column um, about whether he should run or not in 2024. All the things that you just mentioned are going to be the backdrop of 2024. From the Washington Post. Yes, from the Washington Post, of course, now saying that, you know, he and Vice President Harris should get out of the race. And I mentioned that because, again, all these things are sort of coming together, and it's pretty clear that they're not going to go away by the time the election comes. So it is, um, has been a challenging week for the president. I think that, again, he's trying to focus on his economic agenda. He's trying to show that today, you know, he was getting involved with the auto workers union, um, which I think, you know, paints a picture of just how critical everything now is for him, because that politically and economically could have a really big impact on his support. But I think, you know, again, they're just trying to um, dismiss as much as they can mm -hmm. with regard to Hunter Biden, whether it's the impeachment inquiry or whether it's uh, the, the federal charges. But they are also aware that they can't be completely dismissive mm -hmm. of it because, again, you know, it, these are some legitimate concerns that they have to answer to. So I think that, you know, people in the White House are frustrated. But again, this is not necessarily new. These things were all expected to happen. It's just that they all came at once in a five-day period. And I do want to get to another big story this week, which was Senate uh, Senator Mitt Romney, Republican of Utah, decided to retire uh, at the end of his term. And that's a big deal because there are not many uh, Republicans left like him, moderate Republicans. And I think it ties into what we're talking about here in terms of this extremist faction in the House. That same faction is the same group of lawmakers that celebrated January 6th. Heidi, uh, they voted against, a, a wide majority of them voted against certification, Joe Biden's certification to be uh, elected president, and they continue to lie about elections. So on his way out the door, Romney is very publicly uh, talking about what he thinks uh, the stakes are for accommodating extremism in the ranks. And I want to read this uh, clip from The Atlantic where he, well, I'm sorry, I accidentally don't have it in front of me, but in it, he recalls that a House lawmaker says to him that um, they wanted to vote to convict Donald Trump uh, after January 6th, but that they were too afraid to do it out of fear for their family. What do you think that says about the party? Well, you couldn't help but just feel the stoicism in that piece. It was a wonderful piece. Um, and in it, Romney says, look, I came here in part to try and set an example for members like that, for senators like that, to give them the cover, to make the, the strong decisions, to make the brave decisions. And instead, I'm leaving and things are worse than they've ever been, more challenging than they've ever been. And he actually brings up and uses the word of authoritarianism and, and warns. He says, look, he pulls out this histogram of human, the history, charting the history of human civilization over the past 4,000 years. And he says, look, we are an exception, okay? Throughout most of human history, we have, as a group think psychology, uh, congregated around strongmen. And that's what I fear is happening right now. And he's speaking very heavily to his own party. He's also saying in this that, look, I'm leaving now in a bit in a way, falling on a sword, but I'm not done. It's a bit of a nod and I think also a little bit provocative statement about whether there is a place still in the party for members like him, for members like Liz Cheney, and whether there is anything they can do because instead of setting an example, he's acknowledging here that it's kind of gone, gone the other way and has been consumed. It's at the point where he had to pay $5,000 a day uh, for private security for his family. Leanne, another notable part of the report is that Romney details that he texted Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell days before January 6th saying, I'm really worried about security and that Capitol Police are not going to have the reinforcements necessary, that people are going to storm the Capitol. Uh, I mean, do you think that this time around, leaders, McConnell never responds, by the way, right. to that text message, which is what was the stun stunning about it. 
do you think that leaders are prepared now if some form of violence like that were to take place again? It's an excellent question. Um, and I'm not sure. I will say that it's happened once, and I think that people know that it could happen again. They know that political violence is much more apparent. There are more threats to member security on a daily basis. People have learned their lessons from January 6. I was at the Capitol on January 6. I was also at the Capitol on 9-11, and they learned their lessons from that. But the question is, do they know what else is coming? There are so many threats now and how they respond to it. And, but what they're not really doing is um, trying to eliminate the political rhetoric that leads to this violence. And that is a problem. And one right, thing we're that seeing has so much are the, um, the, the court cases that have really set a precedent and I think right. send a pretty strong message to would-be mm -hmm. um, rioters about the potential consequences. Right. Yeah. We're seeing so much political violence, uh, political violence rising, as well as uh, violent political rhetoric, particularly on the right. And we'll have to leave it there for now. So thanks to our panelists for joining us and for sharing your reporting. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And don't forget to watch PBS News Weekend tomorrow for a look at the rise, risks, and benefits of robo-taxis. I'm Laura Barone-Lopez. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.